Hello and welcome. My name is Abigail Wheeler, Assistant Director of Graduate Admissions, and today we are having a special admission spotlight on a Master of Finance program at the University of California Riverside School of Business, home to the A. Gary Anderson Graduate School of Management. I am joined by two of our fabulous finance faculty members, Dr. Jean Helwig, Professor of Finance, who also holds the Anderson Chair in Finance, and Dr. Greg Ritchie, Assistant Professor of Teaching in Finance. Together, they will share some insights on the curriculum and the MFIN experience. Before we dive in uh, to getting some questions answered from our professors, let's do a quick overview of the MFIN program. Our Master of Finance program trains professionals to build a career as a chartered financial analyst or CFA or a certified financial planning planner or CFP. Many students who pursue a Master of Finance will pursue career paths in things like corporate finance, risk management, asset management, quantitative research, or investment management. In terms of admissions, when you come to our program, we are looking for students who have a background in business, economics, math, statistics, physics, or any other strong quantitative background. A couple of other benefits of our program is that you do have access to the Bloomberg Terminal training through the MFIN program, as well as access to a CFA preparation program at discount. In addition, there are some incredible involvement opportunities on campus, including the Highlander Financial Group and the Highlander Student Investment Fund, which we'll get to hear a little bit more about in a minute. Our Master of Finance program is STEM designated, which means if you're an international student, you can stay in the US for up to three years after graduation. And for any students, it signals to uh, employers that you have a strong quantitative background be behind your master's degree. The program would last from nine to 15 months, depending on your style. If you want to take it a, a fuller load each quarter, if you want to extend it to the following quarter. The program is 48 units to complete. And I'll dive into a little bit of the curriculum here as well to give you a, a quick overview. Our curriculum is structured such that at the beginning of the program, you'll take six required courses, which will comprise of 24 units. You can see some examples of those courses here on the screen, quantitative analysis, financial management, financial accounting, fixed income, securities and markets, corporate finance, investments, and portfolio management. Once you take your required courses, you have an option to take two restricted electives from among these uh, finance course options here, and that will take you for eight units. Next, you have the option to take two more electives based on any, any of the restricted elective options, plus some additional elective options, including business courses like forecasting, information systems, organizational behavior, economics of management, or advanced accounting, just as, a, as an example of some elective options. And then finally, you'll round out your, your curriculum with two capstone courses, seminar in empirical methods in finance, and seminar in corporate finance for a total of eight units. Altogether, that's 48 units that you'll take to complete the MFIN program. All right, so that is an overview of our Master of Finance program. And next, I'm gonna invite our two professors here with us today to go ahead and introduce themselves, share a little bit about their background, their experience, and the things that they love to teach here at UCR. Thank you. So uh, I'm Jean Helwig. I have a PhD in economics from UCLA from quite a long time ago. Um, unlike most people who study economics, my undergraduate degree was in linguistics. So that was a huge pivot. 
and there was a little bit of time in between where I had to learn some more math and, and other topics. Um, but my first job after getting my PhD was uh, working for the Fed Reserve. I worked there for 10 years, so I knew a lot about monetary policy and banking regulation. Those are the two main things that they focus on. And then I moved to academia uh, in the late 90s. So my first job was at Ohio State. I've worked at a couple of other state schools, some of which have really great football teams. So that kind of colors your experience as a professor. Um, before joining UCR, I worked at uh, the University of South Carolina. Uh, my husband's from California. We both wanted to be here. And uh, so happy to, to take the job when it opened up. So I've been here for uh, seven years. I'm starting on my eighth year. And um, my research is um, uh, on a couple of different topics, but I guess corporate finance and um, corporate bonds and a little bit of banking, especially since the financial crisis. Um, and um, yeah, I would say I'm also the advisor to some clubs. I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. Greg? All right. Hi, I'm Greg Ritchie. And uh, my undergraduate major was sociology and admin studies. All right. And then after I graduated, I did my undergraduate major at UC Riverside. After that, I went and got a teaching credential in English as a second language. They sent me to South Korea for a year and a half to teach English. I saved a lot of money. I didn't know what to do with it. This was like the early to mid 90s. So when I came back, I started to invest. And this was, you know, almost 30 years ago. And I said, well, if I'm investing, I wanted to learn about investing, but I still like teaching. So I went and got an MBA. And when I was in my MBA program, they asked, hey, when you're done with your MBA program, would you like to come and teach a few courses for us? So I taught classes there, and this was at California State University of San Bernardino. So I taught there, and I was working as a financial advisor at American Express for a little bit there. And then I became a full-time lecturer there at Cal State San Bernardino. And then after that, I decided, hey, if I want to do this, I might as well really do it. So I went and got a PhD in economics from Claremont Graduate university i did that a little bit later in life and then now i've been at uc riverside for about well i'm finishing i'm st i'm starting my sixth year now i enjoy uh teaching any course that they'll ask me to teach the only course that i teach at the graduate level is uh international financial management uh, my research areas include well i have a some that i still do with my colleagues at claremont which basically deals with international financial economics so capital surges and credit booms and financial crises. But on my own, I like to investigate some alternative investments such as SIN stocks. And now I'm writing a paper on ESG investments, like environmental, social, and governance. But it just seems there's just like a flood of them out there right now. So I got to kind of kick myself in the butt and get moving on it before somebody else does the same thing that I'm doing. And then I can't publish it. All right. Oh, man, that's awesome. The ESG is a very interesting topic today. So I'm, I'm so glad you're doing um, investments on that. And I'm sure you're able to bring that into the classroom. A little bit, but not not this quarter, though, not this quarter. <laughs> but maybe next quarter or, or, or for fall. <laughs> awesome. What great, interesting experience the, the both of you have. Uh, so fun. Could you tell me a little bit more about the classes that you teach, your teaching philosophy, and why you love teaching in the classroom? I'll go ahead and just talk a little bit about the course I teach in programs. So it's uh, international financial management. So basically, uh, some of you guys who are taking you know, your undergraduate corporate finance investments courses, this puts an international spin on it. So basically what we do is we start off by taking a look at the history of the international monetary system. We look at accounting, but not from your perspective, not from a firm's perspective, but the balance of payments for the United States. We also take a look at exchange rates. So we look at you know, uh, uh, spot rates, we look at forward rates, we look at cross exchange rates. Rates. And then we also end up applying them to interest rates. How do interest rates affect exchange rates? How do inflation rates affect 
exchange rates. And then we take a look at a lot of what we refer to as hedging. So we take a look at hedging with the forward market, hedging with money markets, hedging with options markets, hedging with currency swaps. And after that, we look at it from the what you would see like in a regular investments course or corporate finance course, but then more so from an international perspective. So some international money markets, international debt markets, international equity markets, international cost of capital, Capital. So I don't know what year you guys are in, in your finance courses, but cost of capital. Yeah, we learned about cost of capital and also international capital budgeting, right? So we cover a, a lot of topics and I think it's a pretty fun class. I'm uh, pretty uh, motivated and, and, and happy in class. In fact, when I finish classes, I'm like, you know, it's just kind of like you just you, like, I don't know, I'm not an actor but I could feel like how an actor would feel after he or she or they came off stage, but it's, uh, you, you leave it all in the classroom. That's what I say, okay? Yeah, so um, I teach in the infant program, I teach the uh, fixed income class. And so what I like about fixed income is uh, two things. One is that it changes a lot with current events. And so when we talk about fixed income, we're talking about, mostly uh, treasury bonds and maybe some corporate bonds. Um, we do cover some other topics as well. But so the thing that's always changing with um, current events is what the Fed Reserve is doing. So I mentioned before that I had spent 10 years working for the Fed Reserve. You know, it's kind of like a government agency. And, you know, the government tries to do its best. But if they mess up, nobody gets fired. And so when the Fed Reserve doesn't do the right thing for the economy, they don't lose their job. Uh, you know, the Fed chairman is appointed every six years and uh, Jerome Powell was just appointed or reappointed pretty recently. So once he got past the, the Senate hearings and all that grilling that they did, then it was raise interest rates by 75 basis points and then do it again and then do it again. And nobody can stop him. Uh, it might be the right thing to do because there is a lot of inflation, inflation that the Fed Reserve um, let get out of control. But um, still, they're raising interest rates uh, every time they meet, and uh, nobody knows exactly where it's going to end. So a year ago, the interest rate was almost zero, and now it's 4%, heading probably till 6%. Um, that's the, the Fed Reserve's target interest rate. And as a result, it affects all the other interest rates that people care about. So it affects longer term treasuries. It affects the mortgage rates. If you guys are thinking about buying a house, it affects the rate on a new car loan. It affects the rates that companies pay when they borrow from a bank or when they borrow from a bond market. So, so I like the, the current element of it and that it ties into what's going on with Fed Reserve policy and inflation. But I also like that it's got very precise numbers. So finance in general has a lot of math to it. Fixed income has a lot of math as well. So, But the thing that's a little bit different is that bond math hasn't really changed for a long time. It's something that works. It works well. We know how it works. Whereas when you're analyzing stocks, it's a lot harder to figure out what causes the price to move. And so I like the precision of fixed income. Um, there's a lot of interesting topics in terms of different types of fixed income. So the mortgage market is interesting. Um, sovereign debt markets are interesting. Municipal bond markets are interesting. But also there are different instruments that you can use to make bets or to hedge with fixed income. So you could um, enter into contracts with options or futures or swaps market. So there's a lot of different things to learn about. Um, it's always moving uh, forward. And so I think it's a, um, a very exciting topic to be learning. So I'll say the other thing about it is that you can look at fixed income from the perspective of an investor. Do you want to put your money into stocks? Do you want to put it into bonds? You know, these days with the stock market falling, a lot of people say, I'd rather be in fixed income. You can get 4% for sure if you put it into short-term treasuries. Whereas who knows what you get if you put it into the stock market, maybe you get minus 10%, maybe you'll make 30%. It's hard to say. So the 4% is looking pretty good. On the other hand, if you were to invest in, you know, 10 year treasuries, you might be taking on almost as much risk as if you were investing in stocks, at least right now. 
But so from an investor's perspective, it's an interesting question to be asking what causes the returns to change. But the other reason why fixed income is an interesting topic to study is that most companies, most entrepreneurs, they get their money, their financing through fixed income. So even though we hear about the stock market all the time, the stock market doesn't usually bring new money to companies. So when we see, for example, that Target stock price fell by 12% today, it doesn't mean that Target has lost 12% of the money that it can work with to create its business. It doesn't change its revenue. It doesn't change um, how much they invest. They have access to financing and that financing is debt financing. And so from the perspective of working for a company, understanding fixed income is really helpful because it helps you understand how much it's going, how much you would have to pay to get the funds to make a new product. And uh, so having an understanding of how that changes over time and what you would have to pay as a riskier company compared to, say, the U.S. government, that's also an interesting topic. So I think fixed income is good from both an investor's perspective and from a borrower's perspective. And so that's why I like teaching it. I love it. I feel like I'm in a class with the both <laughs> of you already. I'm learning so much. Uh, Dr. Helwig, can you describe the value of a master level degree in finance? What knowledge, skills um, can be gained and, and what are some of the, the jobs that MFIN students are landing after, after their degree? So I think uh, most of us in finance, we tend to split the topics in finance into either investments or corporate finance. In fact, those are two classes that you have to take for the degree. So investments is stocks and bonds. And you could also add in bank loans as um, a category or and venture capital. Whereas corporate finance is much more when you're working for one company, you're working on the financing of that one company's business. So um, for example, we have a, a student who got his degree and is now working for um, uh, a healthcare provider. So, you know, hospital organization. And so they have to be thinking, you know, should they invest in another wing in the hospital? Should they invest in some more equipment? Should they change the pricing of um, some of the services that they offer? And so it really is just in his life, uh, the finance is all about the financing of this hospital. Whereas somebody who's working in investments, they would be, um, so actually like another uh, graduate of ours is working in a family office. A family office invests for a family, sometimes it's extended family, so it could be quite a few people that it's investing for, but it takes the, the savings of the people in that family and invests in different things. And because they have a lot of money, they can invest in a lot of different types of um, securities, including some that are very risky. And so he's been working on some um, topics related to doing a real estate construction project. Uh, he also um, you know, puts some of the money into publicly traded equities and into bonds. And so um, you know, the specific things that the program will help you learn would be how to manage money if you go to the investment side. And that could be for um, a mutual fund or an insurance company. It could be helping individuals who come into your office with their personal savings. Uh, or on the corporate finance side, it could be working for a company or the government that has um, a very specific type of business that needs uh, outside money, or when they have a lot of profits, they have to decide how much of the money they do make to give back to people. Uh, and so I'd say that things pretty much fit into those categories. You know, banking's a little bit on the uh, a mix of the two because if you work for a commercial bank, you're lending money in the same way that you're investing in the stock market. So it has an investment element to it. But in order to decide whether somebody can pay back a bank loan, you end up doing a, a lot of analysis that has corporate finance elements to it as well. Great. Dr. Ritchie, can you describe some of the exams or certifications that someone might pursue to get into the finance industry in addition to an MFIN degree and how they might prepare for it? You're going to get a master of finance degree and you want to uh, complement it, supplement it with some type of a professional designation 
the 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 golden one out there is the CFA designation, Chartered Financial Analyst. The Charter, Chartered Financial Analyst designation requires you that you take three exams. We call it a level one, a level two, and a level three exam. If you're really diligent, you can take care of all three of them within about a year. The CFA level one, they offer it in November, February, May, and August. I'm surprised I actually have that one there memorized. The level two, they offer it only three times in November, May, and August. And then the level three is February and August. So you kind of got to schedule it. Each of them typically has about a 40 some percent passage rate. So you have to really put in the time and effort um, a lot of our students uh, form study groups. You can purchase books. You can purchase uh, what we refer to as like do a lot of like the test preps. They'll guide you through it. A lot of them now they don't get the books. What they'll do is they'll 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 purchase the test prep like either through Wiley or through Kaplan. Like the same test prep companies that do like the GMAT, the GRE, and the SAT preparations. But now they just download it on their app. So they can just study on their phone while they're actually, you know, in the library or in Starbucks or or riding the bus there. But CFA is the gold standard in finance. Um, if you're looking to manage individuals' money, you can study for what's referred to as the CFP certified financial planner exam. That would be the gold standard for somebody who's a financial advisor. And, and some of our graduates actually work as financial planners or financial advisors. Um, some, some firms will say financial planner. Some firms will say financial consultant. Some firms will say financial advisor. So, you know, you have what we refer to as like, you know, Merrill Lynch wealth management. You have uh, Edward Jones. You have uh, Fidelity Investments. They're working with uh, individual individuals for their 401k plans, their 403b plans, and their individual retirement accounts. And that's just one exam. So the CFP exam is just one exam. But in order to actually get the designation, besides passing the exam, you have to work in the industry for a certain amount of time. Some of the others are that are a little bit, you know, uh, lesser known would be like a certified risk manager. You know, you think about what how banks work, their balance sheets are opposite from yours and mine, right? So when we deposit money into a bank, that there is our asset, but that's a bank's liability, right? For a bank, their assets are risky loans. So when a, I put money into a bank, right, they don't hold that money. They take it out and lend it to Mr. Uh, Mrs. Jones, who used that, borrow that money to buy a house. So that loan to Mr. and Mrs. Jones, there, that's the bank's asset, but the certified risk manager wants to do his or her due diligence to make sure that Mr. and Mrs. Jones are going to pay back that loan because that's a risky asset to the bank. So that's what a lot of risk managers do in the bank. Um, there's some other ones that are more related to accounting, like a certified fraud examiner, and also another one related to personal financial planning, not the certified financial planner, but what's called a chartered financial consultant. So a lot of personal financial planners will have both of those designations like CFP and then the chartered financial consultant designation after their name. But one more time before and the gold standard is that CFA, right? That's what I, yeah. Yeah, I want to add that a lot of the questions from the CFA exam are, um, are questions where, whose answers are covered in uh, the Master of Finance curriculum. It does tend to be pretty technical um, exam. It tends to be for people who are even more quantitative than your average finance student. Okay. Uh, so I think a lot of people who do the MFIN um, program or a similar program, you know, consider the CFA um, shortly after they do it because the material is pretty fresh in their mind. So I want to add another certification that some of the students have been doing lately is the Securities Industry Essentials exam. So in order to, um, to be involved in selling stocks and bonds, you need to have um, passed some exams that are required by, essentially by the, the government, not quite. So series six and series seven, things like this that. Being um, through FINRA now. Right, through yeah, FINRA. FINRA. Yeah, so, so I said the government, I was being vague on that. But, um, but those are the exams you can't take unless you're actually working for a company. 
uh, whereas the SIE, the Securities Industry Essentials exam, is, is sort of helps you get ready for those exams, and you can take that even before you've gotten a job uh, involved involving securities. When I was a financial planner, we didn't have the SIE, so now they call that the Baby Series Seven, and that's what the the kind of like the 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 term, the casual term. Then after you pass that, then you pass the Series Seven, and the Series Seven basically designates you as somebody who's it's legal for you to buy and sell stocks and bonds for others and then they'll have you take a series 66 which basically makes it legal for you to charge others for investment advice so those would be the two uh, you know in fact when i used to work at american express it's a little bit of trivia if you did not pass the series seven they fired you right away because you can't do anything for them yeah mm -hmm. so it's yeah, they don't, they don't give you many chances to take it again, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Dr. Hellick, can you tell us about some involvement opportunities on campus for finance students like the Highlander Financial Group and the Highlander Student Investment Fund? Great. Yeah, I'm always happy to talk about the club. <laughs> so the Highlander Financial Group is a student club. We have many student clubs, but this is one that's focused on finance and investments. It's open to both undergraduates and graduate students, and students in the club um, spend their time thinking about the uh, the best things to invest in. They have um, guest speakers, so we've had some people come and talk about careers in finance um, they are participating in a competition against some other local schools that's put on by the CFA Society of Orange County, where they um, basically compete to manage money. Uh, and so um, the the club does that, and they've been doing this for a while. It's a club that's been around for a little, about 10 years, and I've been the advisor for uh, most of the time I've worked here. So a few years ago, they were saying they'd like to manage a real money portfolio rather than just thinking about what they'd invest in if they had money. Uh, and so we were lucky enough to get a donation from uh, an alumni, a member of the alumni community. And um, so we started off with $190,000, which we've now invested for uh, just about three years. Uh, so it's a diversified portfolio. Um, we put our energy into the equity side, but we do have at least 20% in fixed income. On the equity side, the students have worked on their valuation techniques. And so they, they identify uh, good stocks to invest in by doing a discounted cash flow model. So they've spent a lot of time projecting revenues and operating incomes and then coming up with the appropriate weighted average cost of capital to come up with a value for the stock. And then if they find one that they think is worth more than the market, then they put some of the funds money into that. So it's a team of about um, 15 to 20 students. Um, in order to be on that team, you had to have taken some finance classes already. So you can't just be anybody who's interested in stocks, which is, you know, the club is that way. Uh, and so as an infant student, most students, um, who are new to finance would be able to join the team after their first quarter, after taking the introductory finance class. We do have some MFIN students who already studied finance as an undergraduate, and then they can join the team as soon as they get here. So um, it's a lot of fun to do that, and the students work very hard. They're really pleased to say that they basically kept up with the, the benchmark in this lousy 2022 market. Um, and, and they mostly did that by avoiding long duration bonds. So it turned out to be a pretty good investment year for them, relatively speaking. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. A, a lot of the finance students just rave about the opportunities to get involved in student fund and really are able to apply what they're doing there to their future careers. Brandon Fajardo is just one example of this. He says when participating in the Highlander Student Investment Fund, he and his teammates received faculty mentorship as they conducted research on equity within the healthcare industry. This prepared him for his role as a financial analyst for the School of Medicine, where he needs to stay up to date on current market and industry trends and articulate his research to various groups. That's right. I mean, they have to, you know, specialize in a sector and try to figure out what's really driving that. So, you know, one of the, the topics that um, 
uh, students worked on that they wouldn't have if they hadn't joined this fund is the material sector. And you know, most people don't know anything about materials. So then they found this company, Albemarle, that mostly makes its money off of lithium, which is an input into electric vehicles. So they made a bunch of money off of the Albemarle investment. And so it really required them to get out of the theory and get into the real world and find some interesting um, things to invest in. Um, I'll pass it to Dr. Ritchie to share a little bit more of any other examples of our student success stories. I know we have a lot of them. Well, the most recent one is we had uh, what we refer to as the uh, Financial Times UC Davis Biz Quiz Championship. And uh, Professor Helwig and I took a team of uh, three finance students up to Davis a couple of weeks back. And one of our members uh, placed second in the individual championship. Basically, what they had to do is they had to read the articles from the Financial Times over a month and a half period, right, from September 15th to the end of October. And basically, there's about 40 articles every single day. So take 40 and multiply it by 45. And that's about how many articles they had to read. So that was really fun, right? So, and also any time that there's like an internship or a job opportunity that pops up, you know, it's kind of neat to share it with them. And it's just, uh, you know, just fun to be in the classroom. Um, a lot of times with graduate students, they're a little bit different from undergrads, whereas when the class ends, the undergrads leave. When the graduate course ends, the graduate students hang out. And in fact, my class gets done. I have a Monday, uh, the, the international finance class goes from two to five on Monday. I typically don't leave the classroom till about five. 45, 6 p.m. because we're basically just hanging out. And of course, yes, we're talking about finance. And then some of them leave and come over to the HFG meeting. That's right. That's one of the reasons why they don't get to go home because that starts like, you know, there's the 7 and 8 p.m. meeting there, right? So they, they're, maybe they're just killing time. Maybe they don't want to hang out with me. That's possible. Yeah. How fun. And what a great opportunity. What a great achievement for our group of students who was able to go up to UC Davis and and participate in that competition. Amazing, I love it. Do, do you all have any advice for prospective students when thinking about pursuing an MFIN degree? Well, I guess I got a couple of things I'd like to say. So, so one is that you know many people get the degree shortly after their undergraduate. And so they probably have done some quantitative work recently, but some other people start a little bit later. They take, you know, they they work at a job and then they come back to it. And so it can, it's easy to be a little bit rusty with math. And so I'd say, um, you know, the more you um, bone up on math and particularly statistics, the easier um, a finance program is going to be. I mean, there's a lot of math in finance because a lot of what goes on in finance is investment. And the thing people care the most about investments is how much money they made. So the returns are the most important number and we're always working with returns. And um, so the statistics part is a big deal of it. So I definitely recommend if you have some training in that to, to um, brush up on it. So the other thing that, um, that I would recommend if you have the opportunity, if it's possible, is to stretch it out a little bit. So you can do the program in nine months. Lots of our students do it in nine months. Um, and so that would be by taking four courses each quarter, but you could also take three courses each quarter, then then do an internship over the summer and then come back and do one more quarter. And so if that's something that works for you financially, then I think it's a really good opportunity. It, it, it opens up a lot more job opportunities to be able to do that internship. It gives you uh, more experience in finance uh, and also gives you just a little bit more time to absorb the material. So if that's um, a, a way to do things, then I also recommend that a lot. Internship in the summer, I mean, one of your big goals there is you want that summer internship 
to turn into a job offer upon completion of your degree, or if you have some other type of outside option above and beyond the internship, at least you'll be able to make a connection with whoever your supervisor was at the firm, at the bank, that they can also serve as a reference. So a lot of times when you're applying for a job as a student coming out with either a bachelor's degree or a master's degree, a lot of time these firms, they wanna see one professional degree, uh, uh, re reference and then one academic reference. I can serve as an academic reference, but your internship is the best place to find someone who will serve as a professional reference there. Yeah, I think also, you know, one of the, the great products that's come out of the internet is LinkedIn. I don't know if it will be great forever, but for right now, it's a wonderful way to expand your network, to read about different jobs that people are doing, to see what kind of background they have. Uh, to meet other people who went to UC Riverside. Uh, and so definitely I would say, you know, keep up with your LinkedIn profile and pay attention to what's been posted there. Absolutely. And feel free to connect with us too. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's my only social media. No Facebook, <laughs> yeah. no. Although I did do Instagram for the Financial Times articles. Yeah. Yeah. We, we highly recommend you connect with anyone and everyone that you meet on LinkedIn and build up that presence. Uh, another great thing is that we have a dedicated career development center. They work with you throughout your entire journey at AGSM. They offer what we call business ready programming in the summer, which helps prepare you to your graduate program and to be prepared to be employed after your graduate program. Throughout the year, they also have individualized assessments, workshops, and job leads that they are sending to students, helping to prepare you to launch or pivot your career. As we wrap up our session today, I wanna to go over a few of our application action items. Of course, you need to go online and start the application. You'll need to upload your resume as well as your statement of purpose. You'll need to upload your transcripts of all institutions that you have attended. At least one letter of recommendation from an academic source is required and you are welcome to submit up to three letters of recommendation. Test scores, GMAT or GRE are optional for submission. We have a test optional admissions policy. That means it's not required for admission, but it can certainly help you in admission consideration, as well as in scholarship funding. For international students, you'll additionally need to submit your IELTS or TOEFL scores. As you can see, we have a couple of rounds of deadlines for the application, and we recommend you submit your application as soon as you're able to submit the best version of your application possible. Dr. Ritchie and Dr. Helwig, thank you so much for your time, for your expertise, for your insights, and for sharing them with all of us today. Anything else you'd like to add before we head off today, Dr. Ritchie, Dr. Helwig? Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Just put in Greg Ritchie, you know, and hope to see you all at UCR in the fall. Um, our so uh, men's soccer team won the Big West uh, Red regular season championship. They just won the Big West Conference Tournament, and they're heading up to Portland tomorrow for their NCAA Division I soccer game. So that's something to look forward to. That's what I'm going to watch tomorrow night. That's exciting news. And, and actually, is one of our finance students on the soccer team? Three of them are. Three of our finance students are and, on the and, soccer and team. And we have, I have four of them in my Monday night course. But cool. one of them, though, he, he's already, uh, his eligibility is expired. But he was on the biz quiz team, though. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. I will let you have the rest of your evening or morning, wherever you are at in the world. We can't wait to see you at UCR. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.